OPG, I am pretty, it's probably about every three months we have a ship come in and offload LPG, approximately. That's an interesting part. I was coming to the offloading. You have the ships, this ocean liners coming all the way just somewhere outstream here. Yes, they come in to... Uh, how, how is the process done? The, well, once, once uh, the, the fuel is ordered, then uh, once the ship comes in, we have a, what they call a CBM, conventional boring system out here, uh, where the ship will come into the river, and there's about 12 buoys out there where they tie up the different ends of the ship and secure themselves, and then we have a flexible hose that's lifted aboard the ship, attached to the manifold, and then it offloads whatever fuel is it is that's coming in into the tanks. There's a lot of consumption of um, petroleum, heavy fuel, of course, which we use for generating electricity, and of course the cars use the uh, lighter fuel for, you know, and how long is the duration for you to do a refuel? That one we're probably going through, we bring in a ship, six, seven thousand metric tons. It depends actually, sometimes nine thousand metric tons. Um, once every two months is about what, when we have the ships come in. Do you supply GEG? Yeah, we supply GEG and Nowick, and then there's the new station in, in Burkama also. And that's the one you use for, for the generators? Correct. To make the electricity. Correct. Now, uh, I've been seeing some trucks coming in here, and I, when I found out they, they come from Mali, uh, these trucks, when they come, they come to collect fuel here? Actually, uh, I've heard a lot of things, but the only thing the Mali trucks come into the Gambia for mm -hmm. is heavy fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they bring in their own heavy fuel, and we store that for them. Very little here in, in the Mandanari site, but mainly in Banjul. And that's, you know, then we load the trucks, and, and they go off to Mali. Um, they do not pull fuel from the Gambia. Um, it's only heavy fuel in which they bought and paid for and we store. Okay, you provide storage for them. Correct, correct. Now, there is a, I know this may be in the long term, but there is the possibility of this facility serving as a hub for other countries that may need heavy fuel, light fuel, whatever. Uh, yes, I can see that here very shortly. Um, the Gambia is it's a very good uh, location strategically for all the major oil companies um, and, and the country. Even, I, actually, Malik, as you know, I just come back from the United States uh, maybe a week or two ago, and even my old friends that I ran into there have even heard of GAM Petroleum in the Gambia. And there's people that are asking questions and, you know, as far as storage or, or being able to load the fuels and things of that nature. So the word's getting out there, not just here or in Africa, but even in America. So it's getting known. How important will this facility be if the Gambia were to be able to get oil, its own oil? Uh, if something like that were to happen, then we would have to expand. <laughs> <laughs> we would have to expand. But it's it, uh, extremely important. I see nothing but good things uh, for the country. Uh, you know, like I said before, His Excellency the President, he has his vision, and and we're trying to move that forward. And and uh, and this is the perfect example of what he's done. I mean, I'm proud to be a, a part of this and in the history in the Gambia. You are an American, and I'm sure you may need time to go on holidays, probably two weeks, three weeks, depending uh, on the need for the holiday. And when you go on holiday, do you feel, yeah, I can just rest my head and sleep because I know the guys back in the Gambia are doing a good job? You know, it's funny, Malik. Um, I, uh, you're right, I am an American. I look forward to going home on vacation. The funny thing is, when I get home, I miss the Gambia. 
I mean, I'm here year round, and I go home for two weeks, and I miss the Gambia. It's like my second home. Uh, and when I'm home, do I feel comfortable? Yes. The Gambians are very well trained. They're very loyal to their jobs. They know their jobs, and I'm proud of them. I'm very, very proud of my people. That means there's a good working relationship between you and the staff, and that is fundamental. That's very, very important. It's extremely important, especially in this business, and, and I view the Gambians and I as one. Mm. We are one. And we're going to move forward together and, and, and help to, to, in the fuel industry, help to push this country forward as far as we can. Whatever His Excellency the President, President Jame wants, we're going to try to make happen. I mean, Mandinari is quite a long way from where you live. You live somewhere around in Cape City, if I'm right. Yeah, correct. And uh, when, you, when you come to work, um, do you feel at home here? Yeah, I do. This is, like I said, this is like my second home. Um, you know, the, the, the country and, and the Gambian people have, have treated me extremely well. Um, I couldn't ask for anything better than that. Um, but one thing I've, I've found out about the Gambian people, they have very, very big hearts. And my people know this, uh, you know, the people that work for me, and, and they know I have a big heart me, with me. And like I said, we are a team. We are brothers and sisters moving forward to make things better. You do the storage. Who imports the, uh, the fuel? The fuel importer is the Euro-African group that supplies and, the fuels for and us. And the relationship between you and them rather cordial. Oh yeah, very cordial. No problem whatsoever. I was going to ask uh, uh, this question because you, you've talked about the loyalty of your staff, meaning that your staff are also well taken care of. Yes, they are. And they know. They know. My door is always open, and I'm always out on the ground with them. They know all they have to do is come to me. They know this. How constant is the training process? The training process, it's, it's never ending. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's um, uh, emergency spill drills, whether it's uh, fire drills, um, whether it's the fuels themselves, loading techniques, uh, safety standards. And by the way, we do things here according to international standards. So it's like I said, it's a constant training. They want to learn. They're always there to learn and they want to be the best that they can be. And trust me, they are. This place is also very fragile in terms of accident or something like that. What are the rules and regulations that are in place to safeguard this facility? Because when I was coming, I saw a board there which tells me that I cannot put up my foot on my mobile phone and ask my cameraman, guys, you got to put up your cameraman. This is rule number one. What are the rules and regulations that are in place? You're exactly right. Now. Like We are very, very safety conscious. Um, personally, myself, I'm like a clean freak. And as you noticed, by going out here, it's very clean. And the Gambians, my people, the employees, keep it clean. This is where they work, and they're proud of that. Um, but you're right. Uh, there's the safety training is always ongoing. There, you're right. There's there is no cameras allowed out in the field, uh, cell phones, lighters, or anything, because any of that, any spark or electrical static or anything, could cause a problem, a serious problem, and we don't want that here. And they're more safety conscious than you, what you would realize. They're the first persons that will jump up and say, hey, you need to go. Michael, you're an expert in oil and uh, fuel. Normally when you go to a filling station in town and you're buying fuel, and you'll see somebody buying fuel at the same time talking on his mobile phone, how dangerous is that? Uh, that's a big no-no. In America, actually, this has actually happened back in the States, where an individual was talking on their cell phone as they were pumping their fuel. And because of the electrical static within the phone, the phone blew up right in their ear. So it's extremely dangerous. What causes that? It just, you know, it's like you have the, the satellites and the transmitter 